How many of you like Christmas music? All right, how many of you like Christmas music in October? I mean, I'm just curious, you know. I grew up, mom breaking out the Christmas music, and if my, I think my sister's watching, she usually is about this time. I grew up, my mom, we, when, I was, when we were little, she had one of them big stereo console units, you know, that looked like a, a dresser. Right, and you lift the lid, and you could you could put like forty-seven albums on there, and they just drop one after another. You know, people, I people younger than me <laughs> are sitting here going, "What?" <laughs> so it was a turntable, <laughs> and it had this little pin in the middle, and and records could just drop and play, and and man, my mom would put the whole stack of Reader's Digest version of the Christmas songs. On that turntable, stereo. stereo, man, yeah, and uh, and we'd listen to music. I mean, it just played through the house, just all day long. And 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 guess what? We didn't do. We never listened to the B side. You just go in there, pick the stack up, and start them over again. <sighs> One of the songs was Bing Crosby's "Do You Hear What I Hear." How many of you know that song? See that? Do you hear what I hear? A star. I'm trying to hear a star. I don't hear stars. But anyway, I'm with the song, you know. I mean, I know it. And, and what is he singing about? I mean, Bing Crosby, this crooner, movie star, all this kind of stuff. He's Christmas time recording a song singing about the birth of Christ, right? I mean, it, it was a thing. And so so it's on the album. And, and so when I got to this topic in the gathering conversation, I, I, I thought, you know, do you hear what I hear? Are we hearing what we're supposed to hear? Uh, you know, the interesting thing about hearing uh, is it, it, it requires engagement or not. And what I mean by that, I mean, you can hear things and it never registered, just whoosh, right? My mom and dad used to have this argument all the time. My mom would say, Earl, you need to go get your hearing checked. He'd go get his hearing checked. It's perfect. (laughs) Perfect. So the doctors would say, Earl, you've got selective hearing. That means you hear what you want to hear. Well, the bottom line is really is that uh, hearing is one thing, listening is another, right? Listening is engaging in what you're hearing. Listening is, dare I say, paying attention to, (laughs) right? (laughs) Because the bottom line comes down to you're not paying attention to me, right? So what are you hearing? Do you hear what I hear? Are you paying attention to what's going on? And, and, and if you are paying attention to the what's going on, I dare say that some of the things you're paying attention to, you probably ought not. All right? I'm just going to say it. Um, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of voices in the world around us. And I'm going to go in the direction of there's a lot of noise in the world around us. And we need to make sure to be very selective <laughs> in what we're listening to. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go all up political on you, so don't even get nervous at this point. I'm going to go the other direction. I'm going to talk about the thing that we ought to be listening to. Actually, I'm going to talk about who we need to be hearing and paying attention to. Okay? Uh, John chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. Now, let me share with you a couple things before I get into this because the gathering conversation is is what we've developed uh, to be this sort of uh, relational journey. It begins with the first gatherings, which is which is sort of understanding who, what, how the gathering is who it is. The next gatherings are about 12 conversations sort of centered around who we are as individuals in the body of Christ. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus? What does it look like in your life 
that you follow Jesus, okay? And so we, we, we've, we've been working through this for a couple months now, and, and the topical references here being about the fact that, that there are certain things in the life of a Christian, a follower of Christ, uh, that should be evident. They should be characteristic. That, that they should be identifiers of, our, uh, of who we are. They're a part of our identity. Who am I? I'm God's child. I'm God's kid. I, 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 I bow, surrender, exalt, glorify God. He is my heavenly Father. Jesus is a joint heir. The Spirit of God fills me and empowers me and guides me and convicts me and directs me. Who am I? I am God's kid. That is the first statement of identity in my life. It is the first statement of identity in the life of any believer, any follower of Christ. We are God's kids, God's children. You see? So, can I just tell y'all something? I was trained to have selective hearing. I saw it firsthand, right? And, and, and my mom says I was good at it too because as a kid I could be watching television and hear nothing else in the room. Nothing, man. Right? Hear nothing going on around me. Man, I was trained. Mom would say, Bobby, get up. It's time to, you know, wash your hands, get ready for dinner. And then she'd say those magic words. Did you hear me? Well, obviously not. Right? So how many times in our lives is it that God has to say to us, do you hear me? Better yet, the question is, are you listening to what God has said, to what God has said to you to, to, to what God is, is laying out before you? Or are you hearing something else? Are you listening to something else? Are you paying more attention to something else? See, I believe that's why we see a great deal of discouragement and distress in the world around us. You know, God's Word offers us a great deal of comfort and assurance. God's Word offers us a great deal of peace, encouragement. And yet when the world, the noise of the world crowds our minds and our hearts and our being and our days and our agenda and our timelines and, and all those kind of things, and the world is just crowding in on us, our anxiety levels rise and our discouragement and our frustration and all those kind of things. And then somebody will come along and say something to us and because we're like this right here. And they come along and they say, and we, and we snap out at them. Because we're not abiding in the peace and the comfort and the encouragement that God's given us. Who are you listening to? You know? Yeah, I think very fondly of Bean Crosby singing, Do you hear what I hear? See? I want to hear God's encouragement every day, all day. I want to hear the, the, the whisper of God's Spirit every day, all day, encouraging me. God's saying, Look, I've got this. I know what's going on. I know what's happening. God's saying to each of us, I know more about what's going on than you do. How about this one? I know more about what's going on than they do. That's what God's saying to us. Are we listening? Are we trusting him? You see? John 10, I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 18. It's a long passage. I'm going to focus on just three verses in a minute, but I'm going to read the whole thing. Jesus is talking. John 10, when I preached through the Gospel of John a couple, three years ago, John 10 is the pivotal chapter. Everything up to John 10 is, is three years of Jesus' ministry. Everything after John 10 is the last week of Jesus' ministry. So John 10 is this pivotal chapter in the Gospel of John. He says, truly I tell you, 
When you see truly, I tell you, that's that in the King. Man, if you all up in King James, verily, verily. Okay? Truly, I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his when he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they'll run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. You know what? In the first century, in the first century, they didn't like being called sheep any more than we do. Jesus said again, truly I tell you, verily, verily, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he's not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. And then Jesus gives one of those incredible I am statements in the Gospel of John. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. But I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. Do you know there have been groups throughout the last 2,000 years ago? Yeah, I'm one of those other sheep. Hmm. All right. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down. I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. We know who's talking here. This is Jesus. This is the shepherd. This is the one who died for us. He laid his life down. He's the one who's given himself in our place, that substitutionary atonement. The fact that that sin requires death. Paul said the wages of sin, you earn it. But Christ himself said, I will die in your place. I will give up my own life. So that you don't have to. See? Why? Why? I mean, you know, I shared this last week. Surrender and sacrifice were the last two messages I shared with you. Surrender and sacrifice. Who's willing to sacrifice themselves for you? Think about it. You know, I can, I can probably count five people. I can name all on one hand. People that would be willing to die for me. Except we live in that community where there's a whole bunch of people up on Camp Lejeune that are willing to die for me and you. You see, Jesus is the one who said, I lay down my life for the sheep. He's the shepherd. You see, he, 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 he is the lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Going all the way back to Isaiah, he is the one who was led before the slaughter. He was foretold, he was prophesied, Jesus is the one. There are no other shepherds. There are no figures in public, in, in, in the culture, in the society, in politics. Any, none of them are your shepherd. If you're listening to them, You're listening to the wrong thing. Okay? See, we need to be listening to Jesus. We need to be following the guidance of our Savior, our shepherd. Because when he calls us out, if we're not paying attention, we miss what he has in store for us. 
We miss what he has planned for us. We miss what he has already made provision for in our lives. Folks, I, I, I'm talking to Christians every week now, followers of Jesus, people that have a real, true, honest, to goodness faith in Christ. And, oh, Pastor Bob, I'm discouraged. Oh, what's going to happen? You know what I, You know my answer is? They ask me what's going to happen. I go, I don't know. <laughs> Isn't that fun? It's like an adventure. Because God's already there. I mean, Jesus says, I go out before them. Verse 2 says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus goes before us. Jesus goes before you. Where are you today? Think about your own life. All right, here I am. I'm Bobby. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor. I, I, I'm a lot of things, right? But first, I'm a sheep. I'm part of God's flock. I follow the shepherd no matter what. That means when the news is trying to get my attention, I'm paying more attention to the shepherd. That means when some politician's trying to get my attention, I'm paying attention to the shepherd. That, that, that means when some group in, in, in our culture, I don't care whether it's politics, I don't care whether it, it, it's uh, racial things, I don't, care, I don't care what it is. I'm paying attention to God first. I don't care where I grew up. I'm a South Carolinian. You know, I don't even know what a sand lapper is. Seriously, I don't know. I mean, they always said, we're a sand lapper state. And I go, I don't eat dirt. I'm sorry. Sand lapper, right? But I had this conversation yesterday with a guy. He, 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 was, he, he had come, he was in Greer. Anybody know Greer? There is a town in South Carolina spelled G-R-E-E-R. Greer, Greer. Who named that town? I don't know. But he had, he had worked in Greer. I was like, I know Greer. I know where it is. Because I'm from Greenwood. Right? I, 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 I grew up in a textile mill town. How many of you know the, the term lint head? See, like two of you. A lint head. Now, why? I, I guess my family, a bunch of lint heads. Lint heads unite. We need to stand up for ourselves and our rights, us lint heads. And I grew up in a textile mill village. My grandma would come home and her head would be full of lint. You know why? Because in the spinning room, ca cotton fibers just flying all around the room and get caught in your hair. Look like you're wearing a hairnet, but you're not. It's just lint. We were lint heads. That's where I grew up. That's my history. That's my. Guess what? Most of the textile mills in my hometown are gone. Rubble. Bulldozed down. Right? Doesn't matter where I grew up. Doesn't matter the, the mill village I, I spent most of my childhood on. Today, I am God's child listening to the voice of Jesus. I am a part of his flock. He says, uh, the gatekeeper opens it for him, the shepherd. The sheep hear his voice. Why would we hear another voice? May, may, maybe the other voice that we're hearing is louder in our lives than the voice of Jesus. Maybe, maybe you're paying more attention. Maybe I'm paying more attention to the volume of the voices. Right? Maybe, maybe I'm giving more heed to the topic 
of the voices. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I was always told, don't listen to the voices. Right? Maybe I'm try- Maybe because it resonates in my heart and in my soul that I want to, to, to pay more attention to something that I agree with. Man! I'll be honest with you, growing up in a textile mill village, it, it hurts me to ride through my hometown and see the Matthews Mill leveled and piles of bricks on the ground. Oh, man, I, I would rather the mill still be running. I, I would rather that, that, that friends of mine were still a part of, of, of the textile industry. I would rather my hometown stay the way it was. Right? You see? Maybe maybe somebody gets up and says, we're going to revive the textile industry in America. Okay, I'm on that team. Because, Because it touches my heart. It's nostalgic for me. Right? Almost to the point of not paying attention to the still small voice that says I'm already out in front of you come go with me but this means something to me this is important to me this 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 resonates in who I am the sheep hear his voice he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out we're the flock. See? Well, we're, we're the flock of Jesus. We're the sheep. You see? I mean, when, when you start looking at the Bible, here, here's the thing, as I was reading up, preparing for today, shepherd illustrations really don't work in our culture anymore, do they? I mean, any of you ever actually hang out with sheep? Any of you ever regularly hang out with wool? Okay, so see, if you've got a wool sweater, jacket, (laughs) sheep are necessary for that. See, we don't see the illustration of how the shepherd cared for the sheep. Best place to look at that is in Psalm 23. David was a shepherd. David cared for his sheep. David defended his sheep. David made sure his sheep were fed. David made sure his sheep could drink the water, steal water, because sheep are skittish animals. Running water scares them. He made sure they had still water to drink from. See? Shepherd care for the sheep, he says. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He has brought all his own outside. He goes ahead of them. Brought them outside of what? Do you know that the word ecclesia, which we translate church, means called out? God has called you out in Christ from from the masses of the world's population. He has named you his own. See, if we were dealing with cattle, I'd say he branded you. But that he didn't do that with sheep. See? Call them. And it's interesting as I was reading about shepherds in, in Canaan in, in, in Jesus' day. And it, it, it still happens today. If you were to go to Australia, where there's still lots of sheep. You know, if you went into some of these communities where, where it's, you know, still an, agra- uh, uh, an agrarian kind of sheep and shepherd and and livestock kind of communities and everything, sheep pay attention and hear the voice of the one who's calling them, who has nurtured himself into their lives. Matter of fact, one of the little paragraphs I read about sheep said that uh, they still have common corral kind of thing, the sheep fold where the gate is, and there's one gate, and and, and each shepherd would come to the gate. It actually, the the paragraph, the little story I was reading about it said that that they'll actually approach the gate singing. 
singing a little tune that the sheep of that shepherd recognizes. And as he begins to call them out, they all start huddling toward the gate together to follow that shepherd out of the sheepfold. Who's singing your song? Something in the world? Somebody in the world? Some group in the world? Some movement in the world? Some Who's singing to your heart? See, that, that, that's the joy of God's Word. That's the joy of the Spirit of God illuminating His Word in our hearts and our lives. Whose voice do you hear? Always reminds me of the story of Elijah. Eli- Elijah on a mountain has great victory. He's on Mount Carmel. Has great victory over the prophets of Baal. Hundreds of them sl- slain by fire from heaven, even to the point of of lapping up the water and the rocks of the altar. And Elijah's there, and and and, and everybody scatters because God has shown up. And Elijah, yeah, I never. Okay, open admission, Pastor Bobby. Ready? <laughs> I don't understand his reaction, right? He runs off to a cave in the south because the queen wants to kill him, and 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 fire buffets the 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 mountain, and it's not, and God's not in it, and storms buffet the mountain, and God's not in it, and 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 this raging, and and, and Elijah says, ah, "God, she's trying to kill me." I'm thinking to myself, "Hey." God just killed 400 of the prophets of Baal. What are you hiding for? And then God's voice spoke. And this is where the phrase still, small voice comes from. God whispered. God whispered to Elijah and he said, I've got you. You're mine. Folks, when the world all around you is raging, listen for the whisper. God's got you. God's got you. God's got me. 2.30 this morning I woke up. It's a familiar thing these days. I think it's age-related, but anyway. I woke up and I was like, God, it's your day. It's the Lord's day. It's your day. Help us to glorify you today. Help us to exalt you today. And then I thought about the message, which I had already put in this outline form. I said, God, help us to hear you today. Help us to listen to you today. Who are you paying attention to? Right? I don't think he'll mind. Will and I talk about this every Thursday morning. Are we listening to more of the news (laughs) than we are the Word of God? Can I just go ahead and tell you, if you're listening to a lot of news, you probably are not getting very much comfort. Okay? Okay? What would it be like if we listened to the Word and the Spirit of God just as much as we, what, watch television? You know, I don't even have the statistics. The average American watches 3.47 hours of television a day. What if we spent 3.47 hours in the Word of God every day? Do you think God would have more of an opportunity to give you comfort and peace? I think so. Do you hear what I hear? Let me just go ahead and confess. That's not a prideful personal statement. I get just as worked up as everybody else does. I just want to make sure I'm paying more attention to what God's saying than what the world's saying. See, when he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. 
I want you to listen to Jesus. If you don't know Jesus this morning, guess what? You can't hear him. You can only hear the Spirit of God going, you need me. See, that's God's own calling you out. Let God call you out. Because if you're listening to the world, they're calling you out too. But God's calling you out with the words, I love you. And I died for you. Let me give you life. Because the thief, which is all that stuff out there in the world, John 10, 10, I read it a minute ago, the thief, all that stuff in the world, given over to the hand of the adversary, Satan himself, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. If you don't know Jesus, I want you to know Jesus. If you're not walking with Jesus, I want you to walk with Jesus. We're going to sing one more song for opportunity to respond. I'll be right here. If you want to pray about something, come on down. If you want to join the gathering, become a part of the gathering family, come on down. Uh, these are, you can respond to God any way you want to. You can sit right where you are. Throw up your hands and surrender and say, I'm all yours, God. That'd be great. You just do what God's telling you to do, not what Bobby's telling you to do. Do what God's telling you to do, all right? Let's pray. God, thank you. God, I thank you just for the peace that you've given me in these words today. I admit at 2.30, God, I wasn't very peaceful when I woke up. So, God, I want to hear your voice. Jesus, I want to hear as you call my name. Jesus, I just want to follow you. I want to drink from that living water. I want to see your hand of protection in a world that's gone crazy. I want to know your presence. God, this morning, if there's anyone here that, that is in that place of struggle, in that place of discouragement, in that place of, of, of aloneness. God, help us to draw near to you. God, as we sing this last song, we simply want to respond to you. Help us to say yes. Help us to surrender. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.